and girls, it's Stevie from SD Gear with So Saves Me Again, and it's actually kind of warm out today, so today is a good day. I'm going to work on some singer slants. I've got a 404 and a 401 right here. Now, the 401 I've already done, and I've spent the past two months looking for the parts that I need to do my 404. So I'm going to show you what I've got for parts and what we're going to do, and then I'll show you what it looks like before we do it. So here's the 404 I picked up about a month, month and a half ago from my friend Crystal, and you'll see her all over So Saves Me. She picks up old vintage machines, and this one was in really darn good shape. It needs to be serviced. I haven't done that yet, and I'm not going to until I do, the, uh, until I do this update to it. This is the donor machine I bought off of eBay, and this is how it showed up with no packing. Um, machine's pretty well destroyed, unfortunately. The good news is, is the pieces that I'm after is internally, so I, it doesn't really matter. It does kind of stink, however, that the uh, pedal got cracked. I'll have to super glue that because the pedal is part of the key of this. As I promised, I was going to show you what I was exactly doing. Now, I've done this to the 404, and what we're going to be doing is we're going to take the power plant out of the 620, the electrics, the plug, the pedal, and we are going to put it in the 404 today. That's what we're going to do. And the reason for it being is the 620, 630, and 640 all have a three windings motor. Plus it's a one amp motor, so it's also about one eighth horsepower. Quite a bit stronger than the ones built into these machines. But primarily it gives me speed control and an on off button. But I like the speed control. The speed control is not just resistant. It has something to do with the three-wire motor. The motor actually has different windings, and later on I'm going to rebuild the motor as well and service it, and polish it up, clean it, and things like that too before I start putting that machine into service. So let me show you what it did to my, to my 401. So the first thing that I, you'll notice is the 401 no longer has a power, or yeah, the 401 no longer has a power plug here. It has a switch. That's part of the reason why I choose the 620 is because the switch is in it and not in the not in the uh, uh, pedal itself. And the 401 is the perfect candidate because after you're done, you no longer need this power connector. It makes a perfect spot to mount your switch. So I'm going to flip my switch on. And of course it turns my light on because I've wired the light into it as well. As far as the light itself goes, I still have the original switch and the light hooked up. It was simpler that way, but it just turns the light on and off. I generally never mess with it. And if I barely press this pedal, you will notice how slow this needle now runs. I switch my switch. That's on the slow side. If I push my pedal in all the way, that's the fastest speed it runs. If I flip it back over to the fast side, it runs about the same speed as the stock motor would. So it gives me that resistance control, but here's the reason why I really wanted it. So I switched it back over to low, and here's just a test. And of course I don't have the machine threaded, but this will give you an idea, and I'm pretty sure that's a size 12 needle or a size 14 needle, but I've got three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine layers of denim in the center there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this underneath my pressure foot. Now anybody that owns a 401 knows when you start sewing heavy things you either have to start it with by hand or give it more juice. In this case I'm not going to do either. I'm just going to run it very, very slowly. And now we're at four layers, five layers, six layers, seven layers, eight layers, and as you see I'm not, and then if I stop it right there and start it back up, it gives the machine so much more torque, I can't tell you guys how much nicer this machine is, that's nine layers of denim right there, and now you can hear the machine grunting, by stock these don't do that, now if I flip it over to the faster side, same ordeal. So the motors have quite a bit more torque than the stock motors, and the machine are such a high quality, in fact, there's so much there, I can barely get it up from underneath the foot. 
the machines are extremely high quality too. They, they can handle this. And then if I go into leather here, we got some leather. Put it back on slow. Oh, I'm on fast. There we go, slow. There's two layers. Three layers. Now you can hear the motor grunting. That's about five layers of leather right there. So that, that's quite a bit. And in fact, it's so much, I can't even hardly get it out from underneath the foot. And then how about some belt leather? Belt leather with some denim on top. And I didn't help the machine. I didn't spin the wheel or anything. It just goes. Now, I'm not going to say I would do this all the time to this machine, but nothing stinks worse than when you're trying to take off on a project and you hit four layers of cotton and you have to reach over here and help the machine or give it more gas and it takes off on you. Plus, I found with free motion quilting or free motion anything, it is really nice to just run super, super slow. As far as the torque of the machine goes, at those speeds, I can't stop the machine great upgrade. So I highly recommend this for anybody. And this will give you an idea on what we're doing today. Got the machines dug out. Let's get out in the garage and let's get dirty. As far as what we're going to need right now, we're going to need the donor machine. We're going to need the target machine. I'm going to leave the pedals and electrics in here for the moment being. I don't need any of that stuff because we've got to do some modifications to this to make this fit into it. Welcome back. Now I've got all the stuff that I should need in my garage, in my dank, dark, nasty, dirty garage. So the first thing we're going to need to do is get a donor machine. And here's my donor machine. We need to remove the electrics, the motor, the pad, all the stuff we're going to need from it. And then the rest of it, quite frankly, it's a 620. It's got four plastic gears in it. It's not that great of a machine. That's the only thing that made this machine great. I usually steal a lot of other things out of it, but let's get started. First thing I'm going to do is I need to remove this bottom cover. So I got me a screwdriver here. We're going to get this bottom cover off. And like almost all 620s, this one's warped. No surprise there good old plastic. I'm not a huge fan of the touch and throws. Some of them were okay. Some of the early ones. And there is some 620s out there that were all metal. And those wouldn't be so bad. I didn't like the bobbin system though. It didn't hardly hold nothing for threat. Not my, not my cup of tea. So there we go. And then this bottom you can just throw to the side. We're not going to need that. The next thing you're going to have to do is you're going to have to take this metal plate off. In fact, I'm going to take a picture of that so that way you can get a good, good view of it. That metal plate is what holds the motor, the connector, the wiring harness, and all that good res into the machine. Now don't lose this plate as we are going to need it for the 404 or 401 or 403. And if you're paying attention, set that to the side. You'll notice the casting on the 620 and the 400s and the 500s, the bodies all look about the same. They use the same casting for quite a while. Now here's our connector. Please, please pay attention to how those go in there. Because they need to go back in there the exact same spot that you found them. If you move them around, you just messed up the wiring. We, and we need the wiring intact. Okay, so I removed that. Now the next thing I'm going to do... Okay, so I'm going to wiggle this motor out, and it's kind of a pain in the butt, and get it loose, just like so. Now, unfortunately, the motor should be tied in similar to this, and I'm going to pull this connector, I'm going to pull this connector, and I'm going to slide the whole motor out, because we're done, and like I said, Remember how you pulled those out. I've done this enough times that I don't really know where they go. And I can see we've got some lovely, lovely cheese repairs. I don't know what this is. 
but I'm guessing that's to the light. The next thing we need is, I need the switch. The switch. Otherwise, you're going to have to try to do your own switch. And to do that, we're going to pop this off. Okay. Bear with me, because it has been a spell. I'm going to take the top off. I'm going to take the top off. There's one screw. Throw that to the side. If you like, you can throw it in the recycle. Hey, look at that. Free cam. We'll keep that. Okay, now that I got that off, let's see here. If I remember right, you set this to the fine. You get a screwdriver in there, and it should. Yes. Yes, I believe it just does. It just pops right off. Oh, that's right. You got to take the buttons off, too. down yes just like that and you know honestly I don't throw these away people are always looking for them because they've got a cracked one and this one's in pretty good shape so we'll keep that and I'll give it to somebody that has one of these machines that's maybe metal or they actually like the second thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the switch off now these screws that you that you're taking off you want to keep those they're nice flat screws and they're perfect for putting your switch on a piece of wood to put in the 404. So you want to keep these screws. They're really nice screws. They're nice and flat. Okay. And there's the rest of my wire harnessed. Yeah, it looks like looks like somebody broke a wire in there and they tried to splice some stuff together because that's usually not in there. In fact, I'm not even sure. That's four. Let's see. That's the motor. That's the plug. This is the plug. Let's see. One, two, three. Yeah, they just had that stuffed in there. Oh, golly. I'll have to fix that up because that's not going to fly. The next thing is, is the light. And on the 620s, there's a little tab up underneath here, and you just pull the light down, and it comes right out. Now, there's a few ways you can do this. We don't actually need the light socket. So I'm just going to come in here and snip these two wires and pull it through. But I do need the wires on the end, though. So I'm going to take my tools. I should have a pair of side cutters. One more. That'll work. I'll just use these. I'm going to cut this out. So we need this. We need the wiring harnessed. So I'm going to set that aside. So, now we've got a motor, a wiring harness, this, and the connector. These are the pieces that we need. The rest of this machine, if you really want to keep pieces off of it, or, I mean, if you've got something else, other uses, by all means. Plastic gears. Plastic gears. Plastic gears. Strangely enough, this one doesn't have any busted plastic gears. Unfortunately, it's still functioning, but how much longer? They look original. So, and we're done. That's it. We need off of that. Now, let's move on to the 404. you don't want to bang around because this is the one you want to save. Now, first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to take the top cover off and set it aside. You don't really have to take it off, but I'm going to because I don't want to bust that pin or slip or hit my elbow across it or anything like that. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to find me a slate of wood. Something a little softer than steel. Because I don't want to and ding up my machine real heavy. I'll give me a soft piece of unfinished plywood here. The next thing you need to do is you need to flip it on its side. And we need to get this bottom cover off. We're going to keep this, of course. 
Turn the cover off. Now, as I stated, I've had this machine for three months. I have not serviced it. I'm not going to service it because the drier it is, the better off you are. Because when we are finished, you're going to have metal shavings in this and you're going to want to blow all those shavings out. We do have to modify the housing a little bit. And I'll show you why. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take this plate off. And this plate holds the motor, the connector, and wiring harnessed in place. And I'm going to set it aside. I'm not going to throw it away. I'm just going to set it aside because I think if I recall right, I'm going to need that screw. But you are going to use the Singer 620's plate in its place. And if I set that in there, you'll probably be pleasantly surprised. Well, i got to get the motor out, of course, because the motor's shaped just a tad different. So I'm going to pull my connectors off the motor. And if you push on the top, get a wiggle on the bottom, it comes right out. And then, strangely enough, once we're done modifying this, this connector, this, this, this bracket thing here, will fit in the plate in this place. But we got to do a little grinding to get it done. Okay, and then the second thing I'm going to do, or whatever, no really order, is I need to get this connector off and this plate off. So I need to get a finer screwdriver. They're little itty bitty screws, and you don't want to lose any of these screws because you will be reusing some of them, if not all of them. So I'm going to take this plate off. And this is a lot of work, but. You know, it, it, I think it's worth it. If you think it's a lot of work and it's not worth it, let me let me know in the comments. If you think I'm making, uh, if you think I'm doing heresy here and modifying a classic singer, leave that in the comments too. Okay, so there we go. I've got that loose, and then I got to take the power connector out because, as I stated, that's where we're going to end up putting our power switch. So like so. Okay. And then I'm going to go ahead and take the actual power connector off this metal plate. Because I don't want to destroy this connector either. I usually put these, give these to friends that have one or find somebody that needs a connector because there's a shrapnel and I'm not going to be using the connector. So I give it to them if they pay shipping, of course. So then I'm going to pop my connector through this hole. See? That plate actually holds it in place. And you should have, yes, we have plenty of slack to get the whole thing out. Now, normally I would say unscrew the wires for the light, but we have plenty of wire because these two wires have to be soldered into place for the light. So I'm going to go ahead and just going to cut these as we don't need this much wire. In fact, if we had this much wire in the machine, it makes it harder to manage. And then you want to keep this, because this is what we're going to need to trace our piece of wood to put in this hole. And of course, the screw that holds it, we are going to have to keep too, so that way we can make it all flush in this hole. And unfortunately, I'd love to say that that's a simple task, but I found if you cut, you need to cut that by hand to make it look really nice. So I'm going to put all this aside and you'll notice right now off the bat that this connector will not fit in there. This is what I'm talking about. We are going to have to cut this into the figure of an 8 so this connector fits in here. The other thing that we're going to have to do is the housing is a little bit different. It's still the same molding but they revised it a little bit as time went. And when they did, right here on this bend, there's a piece of reinforcement aluminum. And on the Singer 620, there is not. We have to grind this flat. So we need to make this flat. Otherwise, the piece, the retaining bracket that holds our motor and our wiring harnessed in won't go in there because this is be in the way. And then we need to make this into a figure eight. start marking and cutting on my aluminum housing I want to point out this is why I did this and I didn't realize this is how I came across this 
I serviced a motor for a 501, and then I tore apart a 620 that I was given because it was trash. And when I was tearing apart the 620, it hit me that the motors are physically the same size. And I thought to myself, well, why does the 620 have three wires, and the 501 and 400s only have two wires? So I decided to tear the motor apart and find out why, and I, start, I found out that there's extra windings inside of it, which I thought was very peculiar. So then I serviced the motor and plugged it in and realized that this is a one amp motor versus, uh, I don't know exactly what these were, but I think they're like 6.3 or they're not, they're not over 0.7 amp. So it's a larger motor, but physically still the same size, and it will drop right into a 401. So I thought to myself, why not put one of these in my 401? I'll probably have more torque and like the machine better. The first one I did took me a while because, of course, I didn't know what I was doing and I didn't know what I was going to run into because I had to put that connector in and stuff. And it took me the better part of an afternoon. Now that I've done two 401s, this will be the third machine I've done. I've gotten it down a little bit quicker. But I just wanted to show you, point out, that physically these two motors are identical. So this motor drops right in there. Now, you don't want to trash this motor yet because there is one thing I'm going to do before I put this one in. I'm going to take the gear off of this motor and put it on the new motor. This gear and the Texolite gear in the machine are worn together. Plus, I found out there is three different tooth threads for these things. So to be on the safe side and I don't eat out my Texolite gear, I'm going to use the original gear that came on this motor. And the only major difference is... They had a lock nut on this one, and this one does not. You really don't need that. I, I don't know why they did that. So don't be concerned that you can't get this nut on there, because this lock screw will do the trick. And this is where the fun begins. So now, we've got to put this connector on this machine. And I found the easiest way to do that is to put it in the hole, and kind of center it up. And then I'm going to take a Sharpie and I'm going to run a line across it, make sure that it's flush, I don't want it in there crooked, I'm OCD like that, it'll drive me nuts if it's in there crooked, and I'm going to draw a line. So now I know where the outer edge of my connector is, okay, but wait, that's just the outer edge of this, so be cautious, you're going to want to make sure that you get up closer. And this is very tough to do, I know it is, but you want to get in as close as you can. And never fear, alcohol takes Sharpie right off, so if the markings bother you, you can take them off. And then I'm going to freehand a little bit here. Like I said, I've done this a couple of times. And this is just rough, okay? This doesn't have to be perfect. But we need to get an idea on how much we've got to nibble out. Now, you're going to ask me, how do you nibble all that out? Well, this is aluminum. Aluminum's fairly soft. So I found the easiest way to do this is to grab a couple of drill bits, start with a small one, and I'm going to drill holes all along the outer edge here. Then once i got all these little holes done, I'm going to go back over it with a larger drill bit and it'll finish nibbling it out and get to the point where I can just knock that out. And then of course you're gonna have little sharp bits in there and that's where I use a diamond file and I hone this and make it look nice. So let's get started. Now I put a rag here, you know, just to kind of keep some of the metal out of it. The less I gotta clean out and blow off, the better off we are. The last thing you want is a hunk of metal in between your gears and then you knock a tooth and that'd be bad news. So I've got my machine tilted up and I'm about to start my drilling. And I really don't have a place to put this camera, so I'm just going to have to set you down and you're going to have to watch me drill a hole here. And then, of course, I'll shut you off and finish drilling all these holes, as this is probably the most time-consuming part of it. Like I said, this is very, very soft metal. And a good set of... High speed drills will go right through the stuff. There we are. And I'm just going to drill holes all the way around this shape. I'll be right back. So 
I've drilled my first set of holes here. Now I went to the I went to a larger bit. This isn't rocket science. There's no specific size, but you want to start with a smaller one and then step up about oh twice as big. And I'm going to start drilling some holes bigger, and it'll knock these out for me to the point where I can just either pop that out or it'll fall out. One of the two. So let's get busy. real hard on this drill. That's how soft this material is. I mean, you are working with aluminum. And remember how I told you about metal shavings? They're going to be everywhere. That's why I don't want this machine all oily and greasy. Just like that. So, as you can see, it's just about drilled all the way through, and it just popped right off like so. Now what I can do is I can take a diamond file or a, a, a router or not a router but a Dremel tool with a grinding bit or however you want to do to smooth that eight out and make it look nice. So let me get that, let me get something out here and we'll get that done. And like I said you could use diamond files. I've got one here that's got a rounded edge and I can come up here and just for a while I've also got another round one. I picked these up at Harbor Freight, and I can just come in here and fine tune this. So that's how, that, and that's exactly how I'm going to do this. So I'm going to take my diamond file. And this is kind of tough because I don't really have a place to put you. Now I'm just going to come in here and diamond file this. Okay. And when I get this done, I'll bring you back. Now I've nibbled out, smoothed, and it looks really good. I think my connector will fit right in, but remember when I told you that we're going to have to come in here and grind this flush? My connector is now hitting it, the edge of it, so I can't get it all the way in there. I'm pretty sure it's a perfect fit, but we've got to get this out of here. Now, again, you can use a Dremel tool, you can use any kind of sanding block. This is pretty soft stuff. And Luckily, I do a little metal work from time to time. I have one of these. And that works perfect for just getting right up in there and gets me about halfway. And then, of course, I've got to use a grinder or something along those lines to stick up in there. And I do have an electric grinder that works pretty good as well. So let me, let me get this set up, and we'll grind that out and see what we got. I don't have to tell you that you should be a little cautious of power tools, as they can hurt you quite a bit. I highly recommend safety glasses, etc, etc, etc. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in here and I'm going to grind this. Now remember, you're working with aluminum, not steel. So you won't get sparks, but aluminum tends to turn into molten stuff when you get hot enough. So let's get some grinding going. slow you don't want to touch this grinder against any gears I actually left my rag in place but be cautious you don't want it to grab your rag either and when I get done grinding this I'll bring you back and show you what it looks like and there we have it took my time I got a nice flat surface here and you want to be careful that you don't want to hit things now I think if I remember right the 401 I had to use this because you had extra stuff here for I don't know, it just had extra stuff, if I remember right. The 404 apparently has less stuff in it, and I was able to use my 3-inch standard grinder, and I got a pretty flat surface here. Now, if I take my connector, it should drop right in. Look at that. Now we've got a nice flush, and you don't have to grind it completely off, so don't be too concerned with getting it all the way up there. As long as your connector goes in there, and you can get... See, I gotta think about this, how this thing goes in there again. Isn't that terrible? Oh, I gotta flip my connector around because the screw goes there, and then this goes there, 
and just like that. See how that new, see how that 603, uh, 60, 620 connector goes right on in there, and then of course my screw lines right up. That holds my connector, my wiring, and it'll hold the motor in. Isn't that gorgeous? That's all you have to do as far as the casing wise of grinding and modifying. Kind of a pain in the butt, but I think it's worth it in the end. Let me know how you, if you do this, I want to know how you ground that, or give me some ideas. Maybe, you, maybe you're a better machinist than I am. I'd like to know. Now the next step we've got to do is we've got to figure out how we're going to mount our switch. Now these are our two wires from our light, which we're going to be soldering to this right here, the switch and the main power in off the plug. And here's our switch itself. So we're going to need that for the sizing. Remember that, remember that plastic plate I told you not to throw away? That gives you our size for the square hole that we're going to need. So, I, you could use plexiglass, you could use plywood, hardwood, whatever you'd like to use. I don't recommend you use a piece of metal. Worst case scenario, you got some vibration and one of these wires rubs through. You, you, you just don't use metal. Use something that's uh, an insulator. You can use uh, smoke plexiglass if you choose to. That works okay. Uh, I got some clear plexiglass I could use, but I don't know. Clear plastic on a machine of this caliber, you know, it's it's a vintage machine. It just, to me, it wouldn't look right. So what I'm gonna use, I am going to use a thin piece of vapor board. And vapor board, it's not exactly plywood. I think this is the stuff that you would use when you put it down in your bathroom to help prevent rot, moisture. I'm not real sure. But I know it's got a really nice ingrain finish on one side and then a, somebody's painting on it. But the other side's pretty rough. And this is the side I'm going to expose. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this piece of plywood and we're going to lay it down. Then I'm going to take that connector, you know the original power connector that I pulled out, and I'm going to trace that onto my piece of plywood. So then I know how big to cut it. So let me get that traced, and we will. I'll show you how I cut it. It kind of sucks. So I've traced my hole, and I've got it ready to go, but before I just start cutting, before I get too carried away here, I'm going to find my drill bit that I just had right here. Golly, things get confusing when you're excited and project you know it oh, there it is okay and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find a drill bit the same size hole as this magically I already had found it and I'm gonna keep this lined up right here and of course I've got it on a piece of wood behind and what I'm gonna do is I am gonna go ahead and drill my hole for that screw so that way it's accurate Instead of trying to mark it and, and finagle with that, I'm just going to leave the connector right in place and I'm just going to take my drill. Just like so. Piece of cake. Now to cut this, this is the part I don't like, I'm going to use a jeweler's saw. And I'm going to use a fairly heavy, thick heavy tooth saw this is wood not metal and the reason why I do this is because I want it accurate I want it looking real nice and finished I don't want to have to do a bunch of work plus this is a pretty small intricate piece I tried using a jigsaw and I'm not all that good with power tools I'm not a good woodworker it came out okay but I had to cut two of them before I was happy with the one I cut and I've decided this time I'm just gonna cut it with a jeweler's with a jeweler's saw so let me get that over here and I'll start cutting and then when I have it cut I'll bring you back so I'm going to come out here to the edge I'm going to bring you with me and remember your marking is on the outside of the connector so you want to stay on the inside of the marking This machine's going to be this way for the next 50, 60 years. So 
I got my rough cutout done. Got my hole in it. And like I said, it's a very rough cutout, and I was a little over. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a piece of sandpaper, and I'm going to slowly hone it. And files. So I got some files here. I'm going to slowly hone it until it fits perfectly in there. I am going to check, though, however, that my screw hole lines up, which it does. So I'm going to sit here and hone this down a little bit, and I'll let you go. This is the most time-consuming part of the entire project. And it could just be me and my OCD. But like I said, after you're done, you're gonna, this is the way the machine's gonna be for the rest of its life. So I like to do good handiwork. Even though I'm not very good at it, it takes me a long time to get it, I want it to look good for a long, long time. Take a nice piece, and what am I using here? I'm using 100 grit sandpaper. And I'm just gonna sit here and around the edges. And then just keep checking it until it fits in there perfectly. So I spent a little time, got it sanded, it fits really well. I went ahead and got a larger drill bit and I went in there and kind of countersinked my hole a little bit because when I put all this together, I would like my little screw that I'm about to mount this with to kind of sit down in there so it's not sticking up so bad. I kind of like it a little bit on the flush side. Now of course, the head of the screw is almost as thick as our plywood so I can only bury about half of it in there but that's, that's better than having it just lumped out like that. Next thing we need to do is I got to make a hole for my button. Remember that plastic lid that I told you not to throw away? I'm going to stick that over here and I'm going to line it up about center of where I want my switch to be. And the easiest way to center it is your screw hole is the center of the piece of wood and just line it all up. And then I'm going to make a mark as soon as I find my pencil. I always, when I project, I always lose things. I'm terrible about it. Hey, look at that. A pencil. And then remember, you're on the inside of this, not the outside. So when you cut this, you're going to want to go on the outside of your mark. And there it is. Now, the question is, is how do I cut the inside of a piece of wood? Well, the easiest way to do that is to get a drill bit that's a little bit bigger than your saw blade and I'm gonna drill a hole right there and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the saw and I'm gonna take the blade off that's what these are for okay and then I'm gonna put my piece of wood on my blade I'm going to put my blade back on. So now I'm on the inside of my wood and I can cut my hole out like I need. And I don't know, I'm pretty sure most of you, if you're doing this, this modification to your singer, I'm guessing most of you have some kind of knowledge on how to work tools and, and do things of this fashion. So I'm just going to literally come in here and and remember, you're on, you need to saw on the outside of your markings. And you want to take your time because you don't want a goofy, busted up hole. And remember, you're working with a pretty thin piece of wood. So if you just go nuts on this little thin piece of wood, chances are you're going to snap it in half and then you'll have to start all over and you'll be angry. And so take your time. And then when I'm done cutting my hole, what I usually do to square it up and hone it is I'm going to use a square diamond file. And I'll just go in there and make it nice and even.
and this is pretty tough to do. This is not the easiest part. Like I said, doing this part of it is probably the hardest. Really. Like I said, I'm not a carpenter. I'm not a woodcrafter. I know a lot of you are. And if you've got a better way to cut a square hole, I would love to know. In fact, make me a video and tag so saves me in it. Because I'm sure there's a lot better ways of doing this, but I'm working with what I got to work with. And that's good enough. So I got a hole made. I'll take my blade back off. In fact, I'm actually done. That should be the last thing I need that thing for. So I can put this up now and I'm done with it for the evening. And then I'm going to take my square diamond file. And I'm going to square this out a little better. Here's my square one. Tell you what, when I'm finished doing this, I'll bring you back and I'll show you what the next step. Okay, I got that filed out. It looks pretty good. Maybe do a little finishing on the back. Get the burrs off of it. There we go. Now the next step is, is we got to have a way to mount our switch in the back side of this. And as you see, my switch sticks out and I've got the hole is just perfect. I can switch it forward. I can switch it backwards. So I'm going to flip it over, and I'm going to mark my holes, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to drill some small holes, and take your time drilling, or you'll split your piece of wood, and then remember the screws that I told you not to get rid of? You're going to be using those screws to put them in there. These screws are just barely enough to get all the way through there. You can go to the hardware store and buy a couple of nuts to put these on. If you want to, otherwise, these screws will thread into the switch. And that's how I did it on the other one. And then, of course, when I was done, I put a drop of Loctite on the back of them just to make damn sure they wouldn't come loose if something happened. But I didn't use the red Loctite. I used the, uh, the blue stuff that's, that's semi-permanent. So we're going to drill our holes. I'm going to mark this here. And the easiest way to mark it is to slide your switch all the way to one direction and then set it up against there and then you can mark your holes all right now we're gonna get on to the next stage remember how I told you you were gonna have to do a little bit of soldering well we're gonna hook up our light and I drilled my holes and I know my switch will fit perfectly but before I mount all that stuff I need to solder these two lights that these two wires off the light to the wire harness of the 620. So I've already stripped all my wires and I'm going to go ahead and just pre tin them here. And I'm using a Radio Shack soldering iron, butane. If you've got a nicer one, you can use it. I mean, there's nothing saying what you have to use for a soldering iron. If you want to use butt connectors, you can, but I'm not a big fan of those. I'd rather solder my wires and shrink tube them. Because remember, I mean, these machines do have a little bit of vibration in them. So there's my first one. And as far as which direction you have to hook them up, there's really, there's really nothing saying which way they go. I mean, you can hook them up either direction. And then I got my other wire on my switch itself. We're going to tin it. And don't forget, if you're going to shrink tube, don't forget to put your shrink tube on before you solder them together. Nothing stinks worse than having to take your solder joint off because you uh, didn't put no shrink tube on it. 
this is my preferred method. I like it to be electrically safe. Last thing you want is to be sewing along and all of a sudden the machine becomes entirely live. And you might want to check the condition of the wire in the machine itself as if it's degraded or getting crummy looking then you may want to just go ahead and rewire the whole thing. Luckily for me, this wire looks really good. And you want to do this before you mount your switch. Because remember, you're, you're going to be using the wire harness of the 620. Just like that. Okay, now the fun part begins. I can now mount my switch inside the machine and drop the motor in. And really, that is about all there is to it. Most of the hard work is done. But remember, when you took it apart, take note which two wires actually went to your light, because you don't want to make a mistake and hook it up backwards and throw a fuse and start a fire, and that just becomes shady and foggy and things people get angry at you, and it's not good news. So, now that I've got that done, and my plate is pretty well dry, I'm going to stuff all these wires in here. And we're going to clean them up inside when we're done, because you don't want them vibrating against the housing and stuff. I usually use some wire ties, and I'm probably going to run some black tape around the back end of this switch, even though it's not going to touch nothing. I still better safe to be sorry. Last thing you need is a wire rubbing up against one of these, and then you're right back to square A. you got to fire people angry at you, etc., etc., etc. And if you remember what I was saying about these screws, they will fit in there and actually thread into the switch itself. If you want to put a nut on the back of it, you can. If you want to countersink them, you can. This is solely up to you. I generally just put a little dab of uh, Loctite on it. So there's one. And if you don't tighten them down harder than Hades, this switch is now mounted in your new plate. sure I get it snugged in there really well just like that tighten this one just a tad more these are actually self tapping aluminum metal screws so they work really swell for this there we are and just like that now before I drop this into the machine itself and stuff all this stuff in there and hook up the motor and do all that, like I stated, I like to run some electrical tape around that. And I don't recommend super cheap stuff. Get some nice electrical tape. I am actually using 3M here, and I like 3M products. Harbor Freight tape works okay, but I've noticed after a few years it turns kind of crappy and then you end up with problems. And trust me, with this kind of a project, you're dealing with high voltage, you don't want to mess with problems. So there we go, got some blue tape here. And I am just going to run a couple of rounds around this switch. Just to be on the safe side. And then, of course, you want to make sure as you're doing this that they point down because that's the direction you're going to want them. 
And I'm just going to go ahead and run a couple of rounds around this whole thing, just like so. Make it nice and stiff so it can't go nowhere. Just like so. Then I'm going to drop the whole switch into my machine. Get all my wires down here. And then I used, I used cherry stain. For some odd reason, I like the color of cherry stain up against this tan machine. Push my whole switch down in there. Pain in the butt. That's not what I wanted to do. This thing from there. there we go. Now, take the original mounting screw that you had, wherever I set it here. Sling around here somewhere. Oh goodness. lose my head if it wasn't attached to me, I swear. Oh, fiddle sticks here. Maybe I'll mount it as soon as I figure out what I did with my screw. like making a video long. Well anyways, you get the idea. Let me find my screw and I'll show you what it looks like when I'm done. And there we have it. I got my switch mounted in. I got my wire harnessed in. I got my light wired up. The next step is to wire us up and before we get too far, we need to switch the gear on the motors. And of course in another video, I'm probably going to go ahead and overhaul the entire motor. So, let me get you down where you can see what I'm doing here. And this can be a royal pain. So on the original motor, you have a lock, a lock nut and a set screw. We need to take the lock nut off. And get the set screw out. Now depending on how many years of oil and everything else, this could be pretty challenging. I'm just going to put a screwdriver in the fan blades here and don't put a boatload of torque on here. Otherwise, you might end up bending the fan blades and then you're out of luck. Then you won't be going back to this motor or have no use for this motor. It'll be trashed. And then I'll get a small itty bitty screwdriver in there. In fact, I'm probably going to use a bit and a nice stumpy screwdriver. I am sure that's in there tight. They usually are. Find a bit that actually fits it here. That's the hard part is trying to find something that precisely fits that little itty bitty set screw. But you get the idea. You've got to take this off because you want to put it on your other motor. Otherwise, if you just drop the other motor in, this gear may not match up to the other motor, and that's bad news. The camera keeps trying to die on me here. This is a fairly long project. So I got my... Got it off. And I'm going to put it on the new one. And I generally put it on until it's flush with the shaft. And then lock down your set screw. Now you don't have to torque this set screw down 50 million tons. Snug is fine. And there you have it. I got that one on the uh, 620 motor. Piece of cake. We're almost, almost finished. We're at the final parts of getting this done. Remember how I told you you needed to pay attention to how this was wired? 
now it's time to hook it all back up. So, we're going to wire it back up. And remember, remember how you wired it up. So I got power, light, motor, spade to the motor, because this is the secret right here, these two connectors, and then of course, neutral. Okay, so now that our motor's hooked up, we can go like so. In fact, I'm going to run the light wire, there we go, behind this motor here, so it's not rubbing up against that arm. This is really tough to see. There's a lot of, a lot of junk in here you got to cram in here. We're going to have a big old hunk of wire after we're done and all sorts of good things. We have plenty of extra, I promise. The fun part is trying to get it all managed, so... Yep, so it's not in our way. And that looks like it's all the way in. I think so. I believe so. And then our connector goes in. Oh, but I got it backwards. Connector can only go in one direction. Remember, you got to put that plate on. Make sure your wires are in there firmly. Now, if it was me, I would go ahead and tape all this up too. But I'm still going to remove this because remember, I still got to service this machine. But I would tape all this up, wire tie it so it's in a nice little bundle. So that way, when I put my plate on here, It's all crammed together. Double check here. Yeah, see all these wires are supposed to be behind this plate so they can't jiggle out. And this is very difficult to get all this junk in here, especially when you got extra wire. These motor wires being a pain. doesn't want to go in all the way. It's got a lump in it. There we are. like so and then I'd put my screw in button the machine together of course get rid of all these wires but you get the idea that's what holds it in that's what holds your motor in and ta-da I am gonna go blow the metal bits out of my machine pull the motor back out and I'm gonna go ahead and service it it's a lot easier to service if you don't have to worry about getting oil all over it hey thanks for watching comment if you have any uh, questions or let us know on our Facebook page see you later